number of different committees of uh, Indian Roads Congress, NRRDA, MORTH, NHA, and received a number of awards from Indian Roads Congress, including Pandit Jawaharlal Nehru Birth Centenary Award. So we are fortunate here to have, to have you here, sir. And over to you. Thank you, Professor Shalata. Thank you for the introduction. Am I audible? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. You are audible. Sir. Okay. Let me share my presentation. You can see my presentation? Yes, sir. Uh, good evening to all the participants. Uh, the title reads an overview of asphalt recycling in India. But you may not find the content aligned uh, along this title because uh, when I saw the list of uh, uh, the teachers who are, going, who are uh, planning to make presentations here and their topics, I didn't have anything to uh, present actually. I knew that everything else would be covered, including advanced topics as well as practical topics. So we spent some time in discussion with Professor Asha Lata and then thought what can be discussed. So what I actually did is I put together some information that I have with me. It might not be, uh, fit under uh, an overview, but I'll have some general discussion with you in terms of the material that I have. So please bear with me for that. Uh, I have borrowed uh, slides from especially one of my former students, Bharat and I am extensively going to use them. So we all know that we, we have a very last uh, uh, vast road network and most of it is bituminous pavement. And there's a typical uh, bituminous pavement uh, structure that you have. You have a foundation, you've got granular sub-base, granular base and different bituminous layers. Of course, each layer can be, uh, base layer also can be multiple layers, sub-base also can be multiple layers. And subgrade also, can consist of separate plus other layers can constitute as a foundation. Now, when the bituminous layers fail, either in terms of cracking, in terms of fretting, or in terms of moisture damage, depending on the magnitude of distress, extent of distress, there are various options available. If possible, you can repair them and then extend the life. But many cases, the distress is of that, that extent, you'll have to remove the material resulting in this reclaimed asphalt material, wrap material. The method of uh, removal of the material is also either by milling, cold as well as hot, or by scarification, by appropriate work, uh, excavation materials, uh, equipment. So what we do with this removed material, sometimes uh, the layer fails soon after construction within a few months. So then you have got a fresh material, Sometimes the failures occur after several years. So then the material that you recover is a different material. So the wrap that you recover from payments can be of different qualities. So typically, most common thing that we do is we remove the material through milling process or by scarification. And this might go into landfills, but this material has bitumen of different quality depending on the conditions to which it has been subjected to also depending on the original mix that you have. And it also has aggregates. Typically, these aggregates are of good quality and then uh, suitable for road making. So this is what we can do with uh, the distressed bituminous material, which we remove by either by milling or scarification. We dump them in landfills or use it in a bituminous layer that is reused. Sometimes we put it in a concrete layer. Many of my colleagues in different institutions are working on that. We put it in aggregate layer, mostly by stabilization. And uh, sometimes we also try to use it uh, directly as a granular layer. So there are various recycling options that are available. We can do it in hot or cold condition. We can do it in place or remove the metal to a plant and then process it and then bring it back to the site, place it. So accordingly, you have hot in-place recycling, you have hot plant recycling, 
cold and press recycling and cone plant recycling. You can also process the wrap material using foam treatment. That's what we currently do in terms of IR 37 specification, either immersion treatment or foam treatment. So these are typical uh, processes that we have in terms of uh, wrap generation, wrap processing, and then wrap preparation. Generally milling of the existing layer and then removing it to a stockpile. The stockpiling can be done uh, separately for different sources. You can also fractionate it and then store it separately. India, I don't think uh, we have such facilities we have created so far, but many other countries, you have uh, wrap storage facilities, maybe categorized in terms of source, categorized in terms of size of uh, wrap you know, fraction. And then sometimes you need to have special uh, features added to your mixing plants to handle wrap material, depending upon how many size of wrap that you want to use. And then some uh, differences in terms of laying process. So recycling is basically, we use wrap material. You definitely will have to add some virgin aggregates, some binding material, depending upon where you're using and which mode you're using, whether it is hot condition, cold condition. So whether it is virgin bitumen, plus rejuvenator, without rejuvenator, sometimes cement if you're using emulsion, also foam bitumen. So there are various binding materials used, plus wrap, plus virgin aggregates. And uh, the current practice is in mo by most agencies that you have a target layer, you're trying to replace DBM1, DBM2, BC1, BC2. And that is the layer in which you want to use wrap material. So you have to produce a material which satisfies all the requirements of the BC1 layer or BC2 layer, including binder uh, properties, including aggregate properties, including mixed properties. This sometimes become very challenging. Meeting all those requirements in terms of binder, in terms of aggregate, in terms of mix, uh, and then producing such mix using wrap metal becomes very challenging and very restrictive. And this equivalence uh, is what we're trying to achieve, as I already mentioned. You have to match the aggregate gradation as specified. You also have to find uh, the total aggregates, aggregates coming from wrap, pressure aggregates, meeting the requirements of aggregate quality that are specified for that particular layer. The binder will have to have, uh, will have to be of similar quality wrap binder plus virgin binder together. Also have to meet, depending upon what the agency specifies, different performance parameters. There are several Indian guidelines which uh, deal with use of wrap materials in payment layers. For example, ISO 37-2018, clause 8.4, enables us the use of wrap in uh, emulsion and foam treated form in a base layer. Currently, the minimum thickness of that you have to use is 100 millimeter thickness. And the strength parameters that are specified are in dry condition, 225 kilopascals, indirect and cell strength, and 100 kilopascals in wet condition, measured at 25 degrees Celsius. For the purpose of analysis, an elastic modulus value of 800 has been assigned to this layer. Uh, the Ministry of Road Transport specifications, fifth edition, 2013, if you have got 10, less than 10% wrap that you want to use in DBM layer, there are no restrictions. If you want to use more than 10% wrap for the BM as well as DBM layers, the penetration cannot be more than, penetration of the wrap binder that you extract from wrap material cannot be more than 15. And then typically you need to use softer grade of bitumen for higher wrap contents. And the target binder grade will have to match uh, the uh, wrap plus uh, Virgin binder. In fact, there is a specification given that the uh, record binder penetration cannot be greater than a given value depending on the target binder that you're selecting. For different options that you want to choose to use uh, wrap material in different payment layers, especially the bitumous layers, uh, hot in place recycling, typically 50 millimeter thick is what you can do. You can do 100% recycling, hot in place plant recycling. Thickness could be 100 millimeter, but restricted to 30%. Similarly, cold in place recycling, 75 millimeter, 100%. Cold in place plant, 100 millimeter, 30%. And then for hot recycling, typically, if you want to use slightly larger proportion of wrap material, we will match the viscosity of the target bin line 
and uh, wrap less bitumen binder. You can also do full depth recycling uh, with thicknesses ranging from 100 to 300 millimeter. Again, similar specifications of indirect tensile strength, 225 kilopascals per trimaterial, 100 kilopascals in wet condition. You also have the option of doing a foam bitumen simulation in which wrap can be used as uh, uh, given in ISO 37 or base layer. Okay, this one we can skip. Uh, these are the options that one can choose depending on the present condition of the road, whether the defects are uh, surface or they're in full depth, okay. and what uh, the extent of our distances in terms of rut depth, in terms of roughness, and other distance parameters. These are the options that we have that are recommended in ISE 120. Uh, some cases only hot in place recycling is suitable, other cases, plant recycling is okay. Uh, some cases you can only go for cold in place recycling. So this is the table which indicates uh, for different conditions, what are the options that are available for recycling the material. These are the asphalt insured MS2 provisions. Uh, you could also refer to MS22 for uh, greater details. Uh, chapter 11 is dedicated for recycling of different materials. Uh, it, uh, it has got several interesting discussions uh, that it has in terms of uh, which are very important. It highlights the importance of uh, understanding the variability in wrap material, and the also in the importance of stockpiling the material by source, also as well as by size, that is fractionation, right? Because also uh, you need to understand that different fractions may have different binder content. Typically the final fractions will have higher binder content. So when you look at those fractions that are stored separately, so the larger fraction may have smaller binder content, smaller fraction will have higher binder content. When you want to reuse that, so you need to understand what is the uh, fraction of aggregates present in the material and also the binder content that is going to be there. And the amount of wrap also need to be quantified, not in terms of percentage wrap, because we are going to have different binder content, different quality of binder in different sources. So they recommend that you quantify the presence of uh, use our wrap material in the mix in terms of the amount of wrap binder to the total binder ratio. They also give you guidelines for selection of virgin grade bitumen uh, as uh, given in MRTH also and then uh, SP120 that either viscosity grading, blending or performance grading grading. And you can also uh, determine binder content by either ignition method or solvent extraction method. They discuss the pros and cons of both these methods. And uh, about the determination of gradation and properties of different aggregates recovered from wrap material, especially the specific gravities, uh, different methods, the corresponding assumptions involved, the corresponding implication on the volumetric calculations and uh, the possible implication on the properties. For example, if you extract the aggregates, get the bulk density, bulk specific gravity of the material, both were used for volumetric calculations, that is straightforward. But if you're doing an indirect way of estimating the bulk specificity of these aggregates from GMM and also get the uh, wrap binder specific gravity, get the effective specific gravity, which we use for volumetric calculation, you might actually uh, increase the VMA and also uh, in, uh, your calculation might show that a decrease in effective binder content, which might actually result in more rating. And uh, the third method is to use uh, these two steps, also make some assumption about uh, the absorption value of the aggregates, which again, you have to make some assumption. This will also have an implication. So you know that uh, any mistake that we do in the estimation of bulk specific aggregates, uh, the current version doesn't have it, but previous version, if you see, they will show you uh, why you have to measure the bulk specific gravities to the fourth decimal point. If you make an error in third decimal point, second decimal point, what is the implication on your calculation of air watts and then uh, VMA and other volumetric parameters? It also talks about the procedures that we should adopt for estimating the GMM of the rack material. Uh, and, uh, also, and also the fact that some of the aggregates might actually be exposed uh, during the process of milling and the scarification. And that exposed surfaces might absorb water in the process of your a measurement of GMM in which you do the dry weight, uh, weight in water, saturated surface dry weight. So that would affect uh, uh, if the aggregates, exposed aggregates absorb water, that will affect your GMM value. 
So they recommend that you pre-coat these aggregates with small amount of vitamin and do the JMO. You know the amount of vitamin that we have did, you know the specific rate of that. You can make the necessary adjustment in the JMO calculation. Uh, important thing is that they keep on highlighting that it is very important that you do the volumetric calculations correctly. For uh, that, you need to get the specific gravities of different proportions and uh, their quantities properly. They also highlight the importance of uh, doing short-term aging, long-term aging of the binders, especially if you're doing a PC grading of the binders. Uh, though these binders might already be aged, they have a discussion on that. There's a typical viscosity blending charge that is given by MS2, uh, using which for a given wrap proportion, for a given virgin binder, for a given wrap binder, you can find out what is going to be the resulting uh, uh, binder uh, quality. Alternately, for a given wrap percentage, for a given uh, virgin binder, what is the proportion of uh, uh, wrap you can use? So there are various exercises that you can use, but uh, you can either use a chart or assume that this uh, the proportion of bind, wrap proportion in binder and the corresponding property varies linearly. Uh, log of is cost varies linearly. You have to establish that there is a linear relationship between the proportion of wrap proportion in a uh, total binder versus the property. Sometimes log of the parameter is linearly proportional. Sometimes directly, to, for example, if you do it penetration or softening point, so directly they are propor linearly proportional to the wrap, uh, proportion of the wrap binder to the total binder. Since uh, uh, many agencies use uh, performance grading, so they also have blending charts or equations or a relationship that we can use to uh, do the same exercise for a given wrap proportion, virgin binder, what will be the quality and so on for various parameters. They typically do it for the critical temperatures for a high service temperature, that is rutting parameter, and critical temperature for fatigue, critical low temperature parameters, uh, the temperatures corresponding to the two low temperature parameters that super, uh, performance grading has. So typically we use four different blending charts to get four different temperatures, wherein the equivalence between the blend and the target uh, value is going to be established. I've shown two of them here, one for low temperature, this one is for high temperature. Similarly, you will have one more for low temperature, one more for intermediate temperature, that is for fatigue rating. So this is how uh, the Asphalt Institute recommends establishment of equivalence between the selected target binder and for a given proportion, for a given uh, uh, virgin binder, how we get the equivalence. Uh, this is the next recommendation of MS2 in terms of uh, what virgin, uh, uh, virgin binder grade that you can select. If you are trying to use less than 15% wrap in your mix, no change in binder selection, you will not do anything different. But if you're going to use something between 15 to 25, if your target binder is, uh, let's say, 6422, you will use one grade softer, that is 5828 PG. Uh, if you're going to use more than 25% uh, wrap in your mix, then you're going to do the blending uh, uh, chart analysis and find out which soft grade of binder is going to be used. But in no case, we're going to use less than anything softer than two grades. But in this exercise, what we assumed is that there's going to be 100% blending. But we know this doesn't happen. That means the binder from wrap, uh, wrap material completely blends with the virgin vitamin, but we know that this doesn't happen. Uh, so the actual blending is going to be somewhat less than this. It is going to be between what is considered as a black rock situation. That means the binder from the wrap material doesn't interact with the virgin binder at all. It doesn't participate in the uh, performance characteristics or properties of the material. So that's black rock situation, 0% blending. On the other hand, what we have been assuming that there is going to be 100% blending the actual situation is going to be somewhere in between. The implication of 100% blending not happening is the resulting blended binder may be softer than what we expected. And as a result, we might be using a binder which is softer than what is recommended for a given site condition. Then there could be an issue of rutting. In fact, uh, uh, we have been actually looking at a road which has rutted in which wrap has been used up to 25% uh, in the surface layer that's overlay, 
we normally are worried about uh, cracking uh, when we use higher proportions of RAM, but uh, possibly this is going to happen more frequently when you use smaller percentage of wraps and when blending doesn't happen completely, the binder is softer than what you expect. So that project, uh, the, there is extensive writing that has happened in the wrap material. So ideally we would like to use as much wrap as possible so as to uh, make the project uh, fe economically feasible. You start using smaller amount of wrap, milling, processing it, and then make, adding that, sometimes it's going to be costlier than the conventional mix, unless you use sufficiently large quantity of wrap. But the constraints for use of higher wrap contents are generally, the matching of aggregates doesn't happen. Sometimes the quality of aggregates may not be good enough, uh, that you find in the wrap material may not be good enough to be used in road quality material. Generally, they should be good enough because uh, they, they were also uh, satisfying uh, the specifications previously, assuming that. And uh, the deg degree of blending that occurs between virgin and wrap binders, it doesn't, uh, it's not 100%. And another issue is that if the wrap binder is excessively is, and unless you add the rejuvenators, you would not be adding significant quantities of wrap metal in the mix, as I will demo illustrate later. So these are the main uh, problems that we'll have, the quality of wrap binder and the gradation of uh, wrap aggregate that you get from wrap material are the main concerns uh, in using higher wrap contents. So the wrap aggregates are going to sections uh, in terms of meeting the target gradation, also meeting the filler to binder ratio, and at times uh, they affect the voids in the mineral aggregate. And the degree of uh, blending, as I already mentioned, uh, if it doesn't happen 100%, your estimation of uh, the quality of the binder that you're expecting may be, uh, may be wrong. Okay. So once again, I think this is what is considered to be black rock situation where you expect that 0% blending. The wrap binder is not interacting with uh, the virgin binder at all. On the other hand, 100% blending means the old binder as well as new binder. Here, this is the old binder. The black one is the fresh binder. So there is no interaction between them. They are not, there is no blending at all. Here, there is complete blending. So you have uniform quality of binder uh, of the 100% blended material. But normally what would happen is that there is some amount of wrap binder which doesn't blend. The remaining binder blends and you have the corresponding quality of binder coating these aggregates. And the wrap mixtures will also, also have to find equivalence in terms of various performance characteristics. Although we do not do all these in India, but sometimes if it is an important project, uh, very high traffic volume and so on, one might demand that besides uh, finding equivalence in terms of gradation, aggregate quality, vendor quality, and so on, you also show the equivalence in terms of permanent deformation characteristics, moisture damage, and then so on and so forth. Uh, let me refer to the project that I just mentioned a few minutes ago wherein we were asked to uh, examine the reasons for failure of the wrap material in terms of writing. But uh, that was a project that some agency is trying to buy from another agency which built the layer, uh, which built the road. So the person, uh, the people who are trying to buy are very comfortable with VG40 mix. They say we got a lot of experience with that. So if it is a VG40 mix, I have more confidence, but these people are using wrap mixes I want that equivalence to be established in as many parameters as possible. Writing parameter, fatigue parameter, moisture damage parameter, binder, everything they wanted the equivalence to be established. So that's, uh, that's the kind of exercise that they're trying to do. So typically permanent deformation, when you use higher wrap contents, we believe that the wrap binder is going to be stiffer, hence uh, the writing is generally not going to be a major issue, unless we find cases that I just discussed a few minutes ago, that if the blending doesn't happen, the binder is softer than expected, or if they make some errors in the volumetric analysis, which is very critical. So generally, we expect that the writing should not be a problem when you use wrap mixes. Similarly, moisture damage, there are contradicting reports, but generally many of them suggest that the wrap mix, uh, when you use wrap mixes uh, in uh, bitumen mixes, moisture damage is not necessarily compromised. 
unless the virtual mix uh, for some reason had a slipping problem. I think most people suggest that uh, uh, unless the mixer becomes softer than uh, expected, fatigue because of the high stiffness and the uh, binder that we're using is generally expected to be more brittle than uh, the conventional virgin bitumen. So it could lead to cracking, whether it is fatigue cracking, low temperature cracking. So we generally expect high wrap content mixes are more prone to cracking, uh, all kinds of cracking. So in this context, I'm presenting a few results uh, uh, that I borrowed from uh, one of my students, uh, a former PhD student, currently a scientist in CRRA. Okay. Uh, he has carried out this in, uh, work in two different institutions. He had to go to USA, so he did some work there, but most of the work he did in India. He collected wrap material from five different sources. I'll quickly present these uh, results. I will not go into too many details, but uh, I'll uh, let you know what are the essential conclusions that is drawn from this. So he tried three different virgin binders for the purpose of equivalence for the, uh, and also as these two have been used as uh, Virgin binders, and this has been used as a target binder. Binders have been recommended for, uh, recorded from all those five wrap sources. And the blends of virgin binder and wrap binders were prepared in different proportions of wrap material. And various tests were carried out on the blend, uh, penetration, softening point, viscosity, and then uh, the writing and then fatigue parameters of the uh, performance grading parameters. And then multiple stress creep and recovery test was carried out and linear amplitude sweep test was carried out on the blends and also the virgin binders. And the gradations of the aggregates extracted from these wrap materials were examined. Uh, and then we tried the blending for four different wrap proportions and three different wrap proportions for gap graded materials, four wrap proportions for dense graded materials. Wrap gradations that were tried uh, one Texas gap graded, Texas B, uh, SMA, and then uh, Texas gap. Texas B, I think, is a dense gradation material, BC, DBM. Okay. So, four uh, dense gradations and then three gap gradations. And this was the blending study that was carried out. Uh, VZ10 and VZ30 were used as the virgin binders, and uh, two different proportions of wrap were considered for this exercise. So, this is the wrap material, this is a virgin binder, this is the this is a virgin binder, virgin aggregate. This should result in wrap aggregates being coated and virgin ag aggregates also being coated. So he has done some exercise in understanding how much uh, is the binder transfer happening from wrap to virgin. I'll explain that later. Uh, he has also prepared different mixes, uh, carried out uh, a strength evaluation in terms of indirect and sales strength measured the resident modulus value, dynamic modulus in phase angle and other parameters. He's also evaluated the performance characteristics in terms of moisture damage, rutting by various tests and also fatigue uh, characteristic by different tests. The binder from wrap was extracted using a centrifuge extractor, then it was recovered. These were the typical binder contents that were uh, found for different sources of wrap. From the consideration of uh, the aggregate gradation, uh, this was the percentage of wrap that could, we could use for different wrap materials. So uh, we were trying to examine what would be the restriction in terms of uh, uh, the gradation. So these were the percentages of wrap one could use for these combinations of gradations from different sources of aggregates. Similarly, uh, the properties of different binders were evaluated and we examined the equivalence and also examined the restrictions in terms of the amount of wrap that could be used in terms of the equivalence of these binders. Uh, for this, uh, we prepared uh, virgin aggregate plus wrap material plus bitumen in different proportions and extracted bitumen from that and evaluated those uh, in terms of all these properties. As already mentioned, penetration softening point, uh, writing parameter, fatigue parameter, and then MSCR parameters and then LAS parameters. Uh, as expected, uh, uh, with increase in uh, uh, wrap binder in total binder, the G star by sun delta parameter, G star sun delta parameter, they increased. As you can see here, the fatigue life estimated from LAS tests decreased. 
with the increase in rap proportion. These are expected results. Uh, he uh, carried out uh, uh, blending charts for different proportions of rap binder, in fact, different proportion of fresh binder in the total binder against viscosity. And then from this, identified what is the proportion of uh, for, for VZ10, uh, VZ10 and then VZ20 vitamin, what would be the proportion of uh, binder that can be used and then what is the amount of wrap pro proportion that can be allowed. So this, way, this is uh, the amount of wrap that can be used, uh, fresh binder that can be used if I'm using VZ10. If I'm using VZ20, this is the proportion of fresh binder in the total binder that I can use. So for different combination of material, these have been obtained. How much, what is the proportion of wrap binder that can be used in the total binder? This is summarized here. So for different virgin binders, different sources of uh, uh, wrap binders, these are the proportions of wrap that could be used on the basis of equivalent uh, binder response. Uh, in terms of various other parameters, the wrap proportion that could be used uh, in different uh, mixes for different uh, virgin binders, VZ10 and then VZ30. Uh, uh, these are the wrap proportions uh, that one can use. Obviously, as you can see, when you use softer binder, you can use more wrap proportion. A stiffer virgin binder, uh, the proportion comes down. Right? And uh, for different uh, parameters, you, when you try to get the equivalence, the Limiting values are different. So what we found is that the wrap proportion that you can use uh, in such a way that the property of the binder would be equivalent to that of VZ40. These are the proportions. When you use VZ10, when you use 40% uh, wrap binder, uh, wrap material here, that is equivalent to about uh, uh, the equivalent to VZ40 binder. Similarly, when we are using the wrap material in gap graded mixes, you could use 50% uh, of wrap material with the binder quality becoming equivalent to VZ40. On the other hand, when you use VZ30, the percentages come down 20% even 25%. 20% with dense graded, 25% with gap graded mixes. And uh, obviously, as you can also see the DBM gradation, which is a dense gradation, is more restrictive in terms of allowing wrap uses followed by BC, SMA, Texas gap gradation, Texas gap gradation, because you got more voids there, you can put more bitumen there. So larger the total volume of bitumen that you can put, you could also put more wrap binder there. He has done some blending exercise. Uh, he was trying to find out, uh, this was the exercise that he did in ESA. Uh, he did a, a stage-wise extraction of the bitumen from wrap material and quantified the properties of the binders extracted from different uh, uh, proportions and different portions of the uh, binder field. Uh, this is the aggregate, the total thing is binder exaggerated in size. So stage one, stage two, stage three, stage four. This was the amount of binder that was extracted in each stage. These are the corresponding properties of the binders in terms of complex modulus value. Uh, I don't recollect what is the temperature at which this was measured kilopascals. So stage one, 19.6 to stage two, 5.3. As you could see, uh, the lower uh, uh, proportion of the binder is very soft or not aged, whereas the outermost portion as expected is significantly aged uh, as represented by the very high value of the complex modulus value. On the other hand, if you extract the total binder together at one time, the corresponding complex modulus value was about uh, 11.5. We also did some small exercise uh, to find out uh, the blending quality, blending uh, degree of blending that is going to be. I'm not giving the complete details here. What he did is he did uh, this in a two-stage uh, uh, process. Uh, he has done it on a single wrap source. And then he tried this with the VZ10 and VZ30 virgin binders. And two proportions of wrap was tried. So basically four combinations, he extracted the blending proportions. So this two stage process was uh, first he separated the, the total gradation into coarse and fine fractions. We left a gap to clearly be able to distinguish the fine fractions and the larger fractions. So the larger fractions were virgin aggregates and the smaller fractions were taken from wrap material so that we could 
clearly easily separate them after the mixing. So these two were heated and then mixed together. And then we found out how much of the binder from the wrap material was getting transferred to the virgin aggregates. That was stage one. Then another exercise was done in which virgin aggregates plus wrap material, similar sizes, plus the fresh binder of a known quantity was mixed. And then we found out what is the binder that is present here? What is the binder that is present here? And the corresponding qualities of those binders in terms of different properties. So using this data, he has worked out uh, the blending ratios uh, from back calculation. Uh, from the properties, we expected that this is the property. So this must have been the uh, degree of blending. So these are the results that is presented for GSR by sun delta value. For each parameters, obviously, the blending ratios would work out to be slightly different, some cases significantly different. So this is with the VG10 binder. The degree of blending is significantly larger. Uh, about 70 to 80%, 87% percentage. On the other hand, when you use VG30, when you try to use slightly larger proportion of wrap, which is 35, the degree of blending that was, uh, which was observed was significantly low, 15, 30, 54, in terms of various parameters. On the other hand, when you use smaller quantity, the blending ratio is working out to be larger. So obviously the degree of blending would de depend on number of other parameters, in including how you mix, what is the temperature at which uh, you are mixing it, whether you're using any admixture, uh, uh, rejuvenators, the, the softness or hardness of the virgin binder that you're using, how long you're using, gradation of materials. It depends on a lot of parameters, but typically this would be the trend that you can expect. Obviously, softer binder, the degree of blending has to be greater. You use more wrap content, the degree of blending is going to be smaller. We also carried out mixed design and then produced uh, different mixes uh, with different wrap pro proportions with different aggregate gradations. And uh, this is the virgin binder that has been used. And mixes were designed and various uh, uh, mechanical and then uh, performance parameters were evaluated, including indirect and sales strength, resident modulus value, dynamic modulus value, uh, and phase angle. Expected trends as you increase the wrap proportion in the mix, uh, the E star was increasing, uh, phase angle was decreasing, modulus value was increasing. Right. Uh, these are the mixes, these are the corresponding tests that have been carried out uh, for evaluation of moisture damage resistance. Moisture damage, he was actually trying to estimate in terms of ITS, in terms of different parameters. I don't think I'm presenting all those results here. Uh, just one uh, TSR value is what is presented for different wrap proportions. So there is no significant difference in terms of the moisture damage resistance of the mixes with increase in the use of uh, proportion of wrap proportion. Uh, he has also evaluated the rutting characteristics of uh, uh, recycled asphalt mixes, again for different mixes, dense uh, gradation as well as uh, open gradation, VG30 as the uh, virgin binder, uh, when he was in USA, he was using PC64 minus 22 as a virgin binder and the different wrap sources. Uh, primarily, two wrap sources were examined for all the mixes. And uh, flow number test, dynamic creep test. Let me present the results. So, the flow number increase, uh, understandably, so that means the rutting resistance of the mixes has increased significantly. And I think this was the corresponding DBM mix target mix, target binder, VG40 mix. So this was the flow number obtained with the uh, uh, DBM VG40 mix. And uh, these are the different uh, rating values or flow number values that we're getting for other mixes uh, with the different uh, uh, wrap proportions. This is the corresponding accumulator strain that you get in dynamic creep test. Uh, these are the results that are presented in tabular form, flow number, accumulator strain. Uh, the trends are already presented. So as you increase wrap proportion, the corresponding uh, increase in the rutting resistance, uh, th there is corresponding increase in the rutting resistance. But this is the Hamburg wheel test uh, that he has done in uh, on US mixes. Similar trends you can see here. With increase in wrap content, uh, the rutting resistance increases. He also carried out indirect and cell fatigue tests on uh, bitterness mixes using ITFT test procedure. 
at 25 degrees Celsius. These are the test results that is obtained. So for different uh, DBM mixes and BC mixes for different wrap proportions. So for uh, SME mixes, dense grip mixes, gap mixes. So to actually evaluate uh, the practical beneficial effect of or beneficial or detrimental effect of use of wrap on the fatigue performance of uh, uh, different mixes used in a specific type of payment. What was done was that an analytical exercise was carried out. Both the conventional mix with its modulus value and the fatigue equation and the wrap mixes, different uh, gap graded as well as uh, dense graded with uh, different uh, proportions were analyzed. Assuming that uh, one case you got uh, target mix, deep mix with uh, VG40 binder. The other case, all those different wrap mixes with the corresponding fatigue equation, corresponding modulus values. The analysis was carried out. Tensile strains were uh, estimated. And uh, this is the payment section that was considered. Granular layer, 50, 500 millimeter thickness, subgrade, 50 megapascals, 160 megapascals, and the uh, different layer thicknesses of the bitumen layer. And we assume all the complete layer has same properties, same fatigue equation. And the corresponding fatigue life as estimated from the fatigue equation, laboratory fatigue equation, uh, obtained from the strain values that are calculated are shown here for different uh, bitumen layer thickness. So the interpretation is that for a given mix BC, for smaller layer thickness, mixed with higher modulus uh, has shorter fatigue life. Uh, the fatigue life being reduced to 16% of the life obtained for mixed with lower modulus value, sorry. On the other hand, uh, the fatigue life of gap graded mix with 35% uh, wrap material uh, is about 6.7 times that we get from dense graded mix. Uh, besides the lower thickness, the larger binder film thickness uh, in the gap graded mix is also another reason for improved fatigue life. Uh, uh, I wanted to share you another couple of details, although I don't have slides for that. There was another uh, student who was actually uh, examining when you talk about the fatigue performance uh, of the mixes in the field, there are a lot of factors that uh, uh, play in terms of the final fatigue life the mixes get. Uh, compared to the laboratory one, there, there are usually shift factors. One of the uh, influencing factors is the is that uh, the mixes generally heal whenever there is a damage, micro or macro. The mixes or binders have got some capacity to heal, provided they have appropriate conditions in terms of temperature, in terms of uh, time that is available, that is rest periods. So the student examined uh, in an independent study, separate study, the influence of the presence of wrap meters in the uh, bituminous mixes on the healing characteristics of uh, the bituminous mixes. Obviously, the uh, the increasing wrap content in mix uh, caused a reduction in the healing uh, capacity of the mixes, but not very significantly, so as to affect the fuel fatigue performance uh, significantly. Uh, a rough estimate was for the materials that that candidate has used. Uh, if I had used a VZ40 mix, if I had measured the healing potential of VZ40 mix and compared that with wrap mixes, the wrap uh, 25% wrap in a mix, the healing potential was approximately found to be equivalent to that of VZ40 mix. That means if I am comparing with the conventional mix, if I use wrap up to about 25% uh, uh, in the mix, so the healing uh, uh, potential did not uh, get compromised significantly. The candidate uh, used a wrap which is very highly uh, uh, aged material, almost the, uh, the penetration was almost nearly 15. So it is that highly raised. Uh, even that case, uh, we didn't find the, uh, the healing potential to be significantly compromised. As I said, 25% of wrap content had similar healing uh, characteristics, which is equivalent to that of uh, VG40 mix. Okay. So I think it's almost 9.46. So that's the end of my presentation. If you have any questions, I can take them. Now the floor is open for queries. So the question is, other than IIT PAVE, any other computation methods were available to compute tensile strength of pavement layers? 
So there are a lot of softwares available. Uh, I think some of them are free. All, all of them use the same theory, uh, linear elastic layer theory. Some softwares have got more features. Ours have got some limitations. So there are a lot of softwares available for analysis of payments. All of them should theoretically give the same answer because everybody is trying to solve the same equations. Should I share my screen still or stop it? Yes. There are more queries waiting, so I humbly request you to join it for the further discussion schedule between 9 to 9.30. Oh, okay. Thank you, sir. Okay. I invite Greena, research scholar from IIT Madras, to deliver the vote of thanks. Thank you very much, Dr. Sudhakar Reddy, for the wonderful presentation on the overview of asphalt recycling in India. From this presentation, we got to understand more regarding the available codes for wrap mix design, as well as the performance indicators of wrap mixtures. We were extremely honored for you sharing your experiences with wrap mix design, especially on the fatigue as well as the healing properties of wrap mixes. It was an honor to have you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. A link has been uploaded. In Next, I invite Tushara Vitti. Uh, Ma'am, sir, professor. I think we can wait for, uh, we can ask the participants to unmute themselves, themselves and ask for a few more queries. Okay, ma'am. Participants are requested to raise the queries. There are a few more queries coming in the chat box. Okay, so the question is, so can you please give more information on how a stage-wise extraction of binder was done? The server has left. Probably he'll be joining only after the second lecture because we already in informed him. No, I think sir is not yes left. Oh yes, he is not available. We'll uh, we'll collect the questions and we'll present uh, after nine. Ma'am, can we start the next session? Okay, Murlisa is here, sir. Hello. Yeah, I am very much here. Okay. I can take up some questions if uh, there are any. Are there any other questions I can answer on behalf of Professor Reddy also? The manager, please read out those questions, Murli, sir. Uh, so the question is, sir, can I, you please give more information on yeah, how I saw that I saw that uh, stage-wise extraction of uh, binder uh, can be done. Uh, I, I can share the relevant literature related to that, so that should not really be a problem. See, the straight uh, the extraction of the binder from a, a reclaimed asphalt material is not fairly straightforward. In fact, in our lab. When we have to get, let us say, 200 grams of wrapped binder, it takes us a considerable time, probably a few days. Uh, this is uh, what it is. And I could uh, do that. So I can read uh, another thing. What are the main constraints in inducing thermal stress in asphalt pavement? I'm not really sure whether I understand. There are no constraints and definitely there are not any location in India in which you are actually going to have thermal stresses. 
probably you are looking at uh, somewhere near the himalayas or some place so that's not really going to be the problem the second question from akil na to raurkela is how wrap percentage is selected in the next design is it based on wrap percentage binder rocket or tent or by the total percentage of mix in fact i am not sure whether you will be attending our offline session there are elaborate and detailed calculations have to be carried out uh, there are a few steps that we go through it for instance the agencies might say look you can't exceed 30% so they will give you a cap okay that is number 1 number 2 is uh, your owner will say i would like to have so if i use the same example professor reddy used i would like to have let us say a vg30 kind of a binder in the mix after the wrap and the new aggregates are added so it goes the solution space is uh, slightly wide so uh, it is not uh, straight so, so normally what we do is uh, to go in an iterative process or like uh, what the professor reddy mentioned in asphalt institute or any other method you go for a blending chart or something like that and in fact uh, to uh, make it even more simpler you could consider the wrap as another aggregate stock pile except that you have some idea to find out how much is the binder in that okay and then based on what is the target grade that you really want you also estimate whether you need a rejuvenator or not and that is how we do it uh, uh kavita ask uh, so i am trying to give as much as possible uh, reasonable explanations and uh, if uh, you still have more doubts uh, you can uh, dr tushara can the yet to be dr tushara can share my email address or i can share my email address and you can i can clarify it uh, kavita is asking why it's found that rap percent or lower for gap gradation compared to those of uh, dense gradation it is not really a hard and fast rule kavita so it is uh, uh, in fact if you are talking really about gap gradation as as sma or as what professor reddy mentioned as texas gap uh, what is the kind of aggregates that you are really looking to uh, substitute there see because when you get your wrap you have no idea about what that wrap really contains what is its gradations contain so most likely if you are using a gap gradation there are many sieve sizes that you are going to skip and we normally see that the amount of wrap that you see seems to be on the lower side but that is not uh, really something that we can say it straight forward uh yes i guess other than that i don't see any other question here sir uh, good evening sir good evening uh, this must be this is uh, not from nit right yes sir yes yes <laughs> sir uh, professor swagatredi sir was uh, uh, in one of his slides he was saying uh, that uh, uh, the rap uh, mix was failed uh, for uh, writing but generally uh, the literature uh, shown uh, uh, the literature we have uh, rap is generally prone to fatigue failure but uh, in one of his study it was failed for writing and he was saying uh, it may be because of uh, uh, lack of like a uh, uh, poor uh, blending uh, of uh, rap binder and the virgin binder and he was saying the the obtained uh, binder uh, was uh, might be soft and uh, it was uh, leaded to the rutting failure uh, why not the obtained binder was harder rather than uh, the softer that yeah was... uh, very, very nice and very interesting question thank you so much yes. for this question uh, yes. see the interaction of the wrap binder with the new binder that you introduce and the rejuvenator that you add is not very straight forward tomorrow uh, dr nivita will be talking about the role of uh, rejuvenator and all those things see what happens is 
you can have a rejuvenator which can work more like a solvent. You can also have a rejuvenator that can, uh, you know, change the chemical composition, makeup of the whole thing. So if all these things put together work in tandem, there is a possibility that you might actually get a good red resistance mixture. So the uh, statement that addition of RAP have to give you excellent red performance or a poor fatigue performance is not necessarily straightforward. Okay, in fact, in my presentation, I will show you data from various places in which there is an optimal RAP proportion that you can add that will give you higher dynamic modulus. But as you increase the RAP, it is not necessary that the modulus also has to increase, it can actually decrease. Okay, so that is uh, why this makes it uh, very, very interesting. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you, sir. Yeah, are there any other questions or shall we start, Professor Asha Lata? Uh, I, I have one more question. Okay, Akhil from NIT Raurkela says, since RAP is not having adequate gradation requirement, can we distribute the RAP content available to the selected sieves and remaining by adding virgin aggregate to attain target gradation? Very nice, exactly. And in fact, I will even go to the next level. I will say that I will process the RAP in such a way that I will pick those fine RAP. In fact, if you take a RAP and proportion it, you know, different sizes, and you find out the binder content, Obviously, you are going to see that the fine wrap has more binder content. Then what you can do, and this is also will answer Surendranath's question, is to pick and choose the uh, wrap from one particular source when you do the wrap mix design so that you balance out the aggregate gradation. Also, you are effectively using more wrap binder because the idea is to push as much wrap binder as possible into your system because this is a precious material. So think about it, you are getting stones coated with the binder. So now if you know how to really handle them, you could do it. So the way, correct way of doing it will be is to kind of look at the aggregate gradation, balance it, and it is not necessary that you need to use all of the wrap, but some portion of the wrap that will uh, uh, give it to you. And uh, uh, I will take this last question and the remaining questions I will, uh, we will do it after nine. Josina says to get 100% wrap, we need to take from 100 different sources. Obviously, in fact, I will go to the other extreme. From the same wrap, you will have variability. Okay, because in our country, when the quality control is not as much as what you really expect to see compared to a few other countries, what can really happen is, kilometer to kilometer, there will be a variation in the aggregate gradation, binder content, quality of the binder. So wrap means variability. And in fact, there is an excellent talk that has been planned by the organizers, Professor Aravind Swami from IIT Delhi. He works only on the variability aspect in construction issues. I hope you will be able to attend that offline talk. And he will be basically saying, how to handle this variability. Okay, so I guess we will stop the discussion here and we can get on with my presentation. So Tushara, can I start? Next, I invite Tushara Viti, Assistant Professor of Civil Engineering Department for the introductory session. Uh, okay, so for the, uh, may audible? You are perfectly audible, uh -huh. Tushara. So for uh, a formal introduction uh, of you to the audience, the, to the participants, uh, I will uh, give a brief uh, uh, introduction about you. Uh, professor Murli Krishnan uh, is a professor of Department of Civil Engineering, IIT Madras. He is working extensively in bituminous mixture, uh, binder, and also related to the analysis of layered payment uh, structure. So he's working on various uh, projects related to both hot as well as cold mix recycling and the research group under his guidance is currently 
doing extensive research uh, on topics related to that. And I am also happy to uh, introduce you uh, uh, to, to the audience. He is my PhD advisor and is the key person who has helped us to organize this course and to set up the course objectives in a, uh, and has given the overall framework of the structure uh, of the course. So with this brief introduction, uh, I let me formally invite, welcome you, sir, for, to address the, uh, the participants. Thank you. Thank you, Tushara. Tushara um, did not say that she also did her MTech at IIT Madras and uh, the MTech project also she did uh, with me. So just to give a, a brief background about myself, uh, I was a highway engineer from 1987 to 1992, 1986 to 1992, rather five and a half years. And this was before NHTP, MOSTH and all those things. So I was an asphalt engineer in NH1, then NH1, the old NH1, Delhi Amritsar, then NH45, then did some work on ECR. Then I thought, so let me just uh, get into academics. So came to academics, did my PhD at IIT Madras, uh, went out for a brief period of time in Texas Transportation Institute for a postdoc. And from 2004, I am a faculty member in the Department of uh, Civil Engineering at IIT Madras. Uh, and so, uh, and Tushara said the remaining thing. Okay. So now the idea here is to walk you through for the next 45 minutes something on wrap mixture characterization. And uh, I just make this very clear. I uh, have taken some pictures. Most of the pictures are mine. And uh, some of them, I have taken it from internet, so I don't necessarily give a reference to it. And if there is a reference that is needed, I have actually uh, given it there itself. Okay, so just a minute. I uh, need to... Okay, so I'm trying to figure out how to remove that side panel. I guess it is just not going anyway. Uh, so this is something that I really want to talk in general, okay, because there are many students here and there are also practitioners. What exactly we understand by material characterization? Uh, I would talk call in terms of uh, two steps and they are iterative okay so one could be experimental techniques any observations second is the modeling part what i would like to call it as constitutive modeling part so when we are talking about experimental techniques again it can be in different scales macroscopic mesoscopic microscopic and there are even atomic force microscope that is probing the bitumen at that kind of a length scale. And what is that you are trying to actually measure? You measure force, you measure displacement. Then if you go down slightly, you measure the morphology, you measure the macromolecular arrangement, a chain length, scission, healing, you name it. You can measure whatever you want depending on the gadget that you have got. But why do we really measure these things because we want to make some statements about this material that we are trying to use in our structure. And in fact, one sentence which Professor Sudhakar Reddy said is very important. He basically said there are many software available. All the software use layered linear elastic theory. Some of them have more features, some of them have less features. So the fundamental partial differential equation that is used in generating these solutions are the same. And one important parameter there is they will assume a modulus form for the material that you are trying to use. So if you have to measure that modulus, whatever be the modulus, there are a lot of assumptions that are associated with it, whether the material is isotropic, anisotropic, inhomogeneous, homogeneous. So we need to kind of do with all those things and then only we can make the measurement. 
Now, after having done the measurement, the next important thing that you do is what is really called as the modeling part. What do you really aim for? So what is the response of the material, stress, strain, time, temperature response? And in fact, I purposefully added time and temperature because most of the material, 99% of the bituminous material that you are going to use, especially within the context of RAM, is what is really called as loading rate sensitive. Okay, so uh, the response depends on how fast or how slow you apply the load. And this is also the structure which is extremely sensitive to the temperature. So within a span of around 40 degrees centigrade, the material can flow or become like a glass. So we need to be very careful of this temperature range. So after having carried out all these experiments, we make a lot of assumptions. We work out some analytical models. And this is a back and forth exercise. So we validate a model, we formulate a model, we validate a model, and we just keep going, so on and so forth. And once we are convinced that, OK, this model can explain this material, then we need to give solution to a highway engineer in the form of a chart, in the form of a table, or these days in the form of a software wherein you know you can plug in values, apply the load, compute the stresses and strain. And this is where the numerical implementation part comes. Now, the numerical implementation part, as well as the analytical models, as far as our material is concerned. So I mean bituminous material, there is a big gap because the complexity of the material is at one end and the analytical approaches are slightly far away. So there is always a overlap. There is always a big uh, mismatch between what we expect through our modeling approaches, experimental techniques, and what we actually get to see even in a laboratory exercise, forget about uh, the field. So what I am going to do is to kind of walk you through some of these issues and in fact, I put together a lot of slides today morning. Then I realized that in an online forum where I am not able to see any of you. And in fact, all of us here, at least some of you who are teachers here, we suffered through this two years COVID period in which we were asked to teach students highway engineering, pavement design, pavement materials without even seeing them. And it was not really a great exercise to me as a faculty as well as to the students also. So I kind of simplified the whole thing. So I invite you, whether uh, Dr. Asha Lata has permitted you or not, I invite you to come to CET with or without certificate so that we can actually have a physical interaction. And only in a physical interaction, I will we will be able to do justice to some of these complexities that you see here. Okay, so this is the overview. I would like to talk about, uh, because Tushara said you talk about wrap characterization. So I need to talk in terms of foam, emulsion, as well as the re reclaimed asphalt binder. Then as far as the mixture characterization is concerned, it could be cold mix and hot mix. There are some portions that I am touching briefly. Some of the portions I am not touching it now. I am uh, pushing them to the next Monday and Tuesday talk that I will have. So in fact, you can ask this question like what is this exactly this wrap so it could be something like this which is what is reclaimed it could be the processed one and then what you see here is a beautiful ccpr surface currently being laid in the gazipur uh, gaziabad aligarh project okay now basically we need to understand what constitutes wrap and in fact this is a, what you can say the civil engineering way of doing it so we somehow are very smart when it comes to cooking up mixtures. You know, we, we put them together. Then after that, we know how to make them work. Then after that, we go back and find out how they actually start working. See, for instance, if you look at it, in the hot mix recycling part, you are going to have uh, wrap, you are going to have new aggregates, new binder, rejuvenator, and if needed, okay? Cold mix recycling is even more interesting. It's a confusion whether it is a granular material or a bituminous material. So you will have wrap, you will have new aggregates, you can have as a binder emulsion or it can be formed bitumen. You will also add what is called as water 
and then some amount of active filler is added. So these many constituents are added and that too there is also a sequence in which you add these things. So emulsion comes last and so on and so forth. Okay, right. Now there is a, a very beautiful statement that uh, uh, is there in Caltrans spec and incidentally Caltrans does not still have a spec for CCR, CCPR. Hmm. Okay, so CCPR means you take the wrap, you process it in the plant, add emulsion to it and bring it to the site. Okay, and we will be talking about the next design issues on Tuesday, next Tuesday. Right, now two important statements to be made. What do you really mean as recycling? You reuse it for the same purpose. So that means if you take your bituminous concrete and dense bituminous macadam, you add something to it and you want it to function like a uh, bituminous material, you call it as recycling. So you don't make it into a granular layer. When you're talking about reclamation, you reuse it for a different purpose. Whatever was in the top layer now goes to the base coast layer. Okay, and this is where the layered linear elastic theory properties becomes very critical. Okay, so you are assuming that the material <clears throat> now transition from a viscoelastic material to an elastic plastic material. It may not happen, right? Now, this is a very interesting chart. I just picked it up from TG2 and uh, there are different variations to it. So you can actually see what is really called as BSM. BSM is your bitumen stabilized material. Now, if you are talking in terms of y-axis, if you keep adding cement to it, uh, you are going to get a stiff, a brittle material. Okay, lightly cemented to strongly cemented. Typically, 4% is very high. I'm just showing it here. But this is a material which is your regular material, crushed to stone, good quality gravel or poor quality gravel. You are talking in terms of your regular granular material. And though they have written it as stress dependent behavior, I will call it as pressure dependent behavior. So this is at one extreme. On the other extreme, you see here as the bitumen is added, percentage is added here, you get your hot mix asphalt and it is temperature dependent mostly the viscoelastic behavior. Now your bituminous stabilized material is somewhere here. So depending on the temperature, it could go here. Depending on the dosage of cement, it could go here. So this is a, uh, in the most interesting aspect of this particular material. Now you can actually ask, ask this question. So why is this important? You know, I, I just want to get on and, you know, do all the recycling and all those things and all. But if you really want to do it, what is the first step you will do? You will identify a highway project that is having a lot of distress. So you will decide that, okay, I'm going to do uh, uh, use the wrap and do a full depth reclamation or partial reclamation. I would like to add some wrap layers. Now, the owner is going to ask you this question. What is the traffic that is going to come? What is the layer thickness that you are going to add? What are the material properties that are that you are going to use? What is the next design method that you are going to follow? So now you are uh, basically back to the basics. So that means if you need to determine the thickness of this layer, right? You know, I take this wearing course and binder course, I mill it, I lay it here. So if I make it like a base layer, in my layer analysis program, I need to put some modulus values. So I have to measure it and I should know how to measure it. If I am going to use it in the asphalt layers, I have to measure something else. Okay. And I should know how to measure it and I should substitute it here. And in fact, to just give a simple example, if you take our own IRC 37, IRC 37 will tell you Okay, measure the resilient modulus of granular material. So this is cylindrical sample subjected to repeated Haversine compression for a wide range of confinement conditions. 15 sequences you are expected to do and find out the resilient modulus, granular material. But the same IRC 37 will tell you, use uh, ASTM D4123, which is a withdrawn code, 
and find out the resilient modulus mm. in the repeated load indirect tensile mode. Okay, and that you will be probably measuring at 25, 30, 35 degrees centigrade. Okay, now the uh, name may be the same, but the test procedures are completely different. One is done at the room temperature for a range of confinement condition. Another is done at the specific annual average payment temperature. So what I'm trying to say is, when you want to do the recycling, you need to know what is the next design procedure that you are going to follow. What is the modulus parameter that you are going to use and how to actually measure it? So if you have to answer all those questions, we need to really understand what are these ingredients and how do they really work in detail. Okay, so let me just walk you through the first portion, which is the foam. The foam is a very interesting thing. And in fact, if you go read the history about foamy, uh, what they used to do and People have died. There have been accidents in 1950s. Uh, you heat bitumen to 150, 160 degrees centigrade and pour a uh, bucket of cold water on it. So what you basically have an explosion. So it took uh, quite a time, bit of time, which then did a lot of work in related to that. And uh, originally, uh, many of the oil companies, yes, so many of them have patents related to uh, foaming. So what you really do here is you introduce, you heat your bitumen to a specific temperature. Now the temperature is the first critical thing and then add some percentage of cold water. The water when it gets in contact with the bitumen at the high temperature becomes steam, diffuses and then you are going to have expansion. Now there are many different types of foams. The soap bubble that you use in your washing machine is an aqueous foam. An aqueous foam has a large shelf life. So that means, you know, you just add soap water and then try to uh, whip it by your hand. The bubbles are going to stay there for quite some time. There will be drainage of the liquid along the foam boundary, but that's a different issue. A non-aqueous foam like uh, bituminous material have a very short shelf life. So what we really call as half-life what are called as expansion ratio. There are many parameters associated with foaming that is available here. So I'm just going to show uh, how these things really happen. So you can have expansion ratio, you can have half-life, you can have foaming index, you can have rate of collapse. And in fact, if you just see in terms of expansion ratio versus uh, time, you can actually see that uh, there are two stages here. One stage in which there is an instantaneous collapse. And in fact, this is what you really call it as half-life, whatever is the full ER max to 0.5 of that. And then there is a smaller bubble or semi-state bubble that is a gradual and slower collapse. Now this whole... Uh, uh, way the manner in which the expansion ratio is reducing could be easily fitted with this kind of an exponential TK function. This is how you basically define your expansion ratio. And this forming index is nothing but the area from integral T is equal to zero to 60. So this kind of tells you how exactly the form is capable of, uh, you know, the sustaining it and this rate of collapse is more related to this particular portion here. Okay, now uh, there are uh, many issues here. You know, as a payment engineer, what I would really like to understand is so you are saying that I have to heat bitumen to 160 degrees centigrade and I have to pour water. Oh. Uh, yeah, so what happens to the bitumen? Will it get aged? See, because I am always interested in short-term aging, long-term aging kind of a thing. Okay, so when IR was done, Fourier transformed infrared spectroscopy, if you don't know what this technique is, uh, we can talk about it later. In fact, Dr. Nevita, who is here, is an expert in that area. So she can actually tell more about it at a different period. But basically what it tells you is, how do you really quantify some of the 
chemical functionalities, for instance, aromaticity, saturates, sulfoxide, etc. So when uh, a PG58 minus 22, now I'm not really sure how many of you here will know about PG58 minus 22, but I'm just going to leave it like that. You can think of it like a grade of bitumen. And it is done with 2% of foaming water content, FWC, 3.5%. Similarly, you can actually see it. Two things were seen. There was no change in the uh, uh, macromolecular thing that you found, the functionality that you see. But as the water content increased, there was a slight reduction in the aging was seen here. Okay, so this is as recent as. 2019. Now, another important thing uh, which one should worry about when we are using this uh, uh, material in the field is, okay, what exactly happens to the workability of the material? Because, you know, you are uh, pressurizing this bitumen and then spraying on top of it. You want to try to see how exactly is the workability, whether there is any workability issue is there or not. Now, to measure that uh, friction, interfacial friction or something like that, uh, there are interesting ways in which one can do it. See, because you need to understand, you know, you are basically rubbing two surfaces against each other and there is this wrap, you have added some new aggregate and then you have added water. Now, why do you really add water? Because you want the foam to move inside, okay, to give that sufficient workability. So, there has to be some way of measuring it. And there are some tribological measurements that are well known that work in some other area is also being used here. So boundary regime, in fact, if you measure the coefficient of friction, it goes something like this boundary regime. There is a mixed regime, there is an elastohydrodynamic regime, and there is a hydrodynamic regime. So in fact, we are about to acquire one uh, tribological setup in our rheometer to measure the interfacial friction. So if some of you are interested, just let me know. Now, what is the really the catch? What happens is when there is a uh, interfacial friction is measured, and this is very relevant for vomix. So that is the reason why I just want to bring this here. Now, what is the perceived advantages of vomix? They basically say, oh, you can compact it at much lower temperature. Now, what will impede compaction? It is going to be the workability. How do you quantify the workability? You measure some of the interfacial friction. And so what happens is uh, when this was measured from all the way from 25 degrees centigrade to 135 degrees centigrade, you can actually see that there was not much significant difference. In, in fact, if you just take a look at what happens at 100 degrees centigrade, in terms of the friction, there was not much difference at all, uh, depending on the type of uh, foam that you produced. And what really is the catch? The catch is how much of bitumen is actually used in uh, BSM in the foam. That is the catch. And uh, to me, it is more like a construction convenience. And uh, you have actually uh, recycled the material, which is held together at a disparate points. You don't have any control by chunks of foamed or collapsed bitumen. There are success stories. There are also stories that are not successful. It all depends on how much control your construction crew has on it. But the point is, you can use a lot of wrap. You can do this construction very fast. Uh, and we will also now see what happens to the response of the material. And this is very interesting because though you say that you are adding bitumen very little, what happens to its behavior? We will see as we go along. And one main problem which everyone has faced as far as this particular technology is concerned is how do you really measure these things? Okay, see, because they will be using a dipstick and it is very approximate. So people go very fancy, try to use some kind of a ultrasonic device and try to capture, take pictures of the foam at a different time periods and then try to measure the uh, distribution or the density of the uh, bubble as well as bitumen as well as the water at this particular and the void volume. So you can go as much detail as you really want because ultimately these kind of studies will tell you how to 
calibrate your setup so that when you go start doing your construction, you will have some confidence about how the foam gets actually dispersed here. So now let us come to the next one, which is the emulsion part. Tushara, if I shoot off by fire 10 minutes, there won't be any problem, right? No issue, sir. Okay, right. Thank you. Anyway, uh, this is online, so people can always mute and then move, okay? Which is has happened to many of us in our classes, right? So let us come back to the emulsion part. In fact, I am just giving you a very simplified diagram of emulsion manufacture. In fact, I had a brilliant student by name Adira. Uh, she uh, made this picture. Uh, she did a lot of work related to workability or estimating how the uh, emulsion varies. And in fact, this is a very simple question that uh, uh, she and I wanted to answer. Uh, similar to short-term aging, similar to long-term aging that you see in for hot mix as well, because there is the short-term aging that we say simulates the aging that happens to the material in the field during construction. What we really wanted to know was what actually happens when the emulsion is uh, breaking. Okay, so she made the emulsions. We have an emulsion mill in our laboratory. So the binder at 110 to 130 degree centigrade is non-Newtonian. Non-Newtonian means your viscosity is going to be a function of shear rate. I will say it like that and leave it. So this is the soap solution that you are going to make it here. So water, acid and surfactant. The dosages are nominal dosages. Depends on what kind of emulsion that you really want to make. So we keep this pH 1.8 to 2, 2 cationic emulsion we are trying to make. And the outlet temperature is less than 95 degrees centigrade for obvious reasons. So we keep the emulsion at 65 degrees centigrade for 12 to 15 hours. So this is, this is typically how the emulsion is actually made. And in fact, I joke in the class, one uh, interesting thing is to make an emulsion. That's a tedious task. Another thing is to break the emulsion. Okay, so the general procedure that is normally assumed is, you know, what you have, what you are really seeing here is uh, 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 droplets of bitumen and you can actually see there is a coating there, which is the surfactant, okay, and which is basically ensuring that these blobs are away from each other and slowly they can come together any reasons the water content can reduce or some chemical interactions can happen. So you see flocculation happening. And then after the flocculation, there is something called the coalescence happen. And then the gel contraction. Now up to this point is irreversible. So that means you can back and forth and go here. But the moment you come to this side, it becomes irreversible. Now, how do this same thing uh, work in the presence of uh, aggregate particles. So again, we can have two types of scenario. You can have reactive aggregates, non-reactive aggregates. So that means, let us say you have a cationic emulsion. So you have a net positive charge and then you are going to have an aggregate that is having a completely opposite charge. You are basically going to see that there is a sudden uh, interaction that is going to happen. But if the charges are the same, the emulsion is not going to break that easily. So if the non-reactive aggregates, the only way in which the emulsion can break, there are many ways in which the emulsion can break. I'm just trying to simplify it here, is through what is called as evaporation kinetics. The water goes and then the emulsion uh, becomes unstable thermodynamically and then slowly the film starts forming here. On the other hand, if you are looking at reactive aggregates, there is a gelling straight away happens and it is the contraction kinetics that basically plays a critical role. Now, this is fascinating really because in fact, what I am showing you here, I, I mean, I have a similar picture that we made in our laboratory and unfortunately, I lost the video also. I have to make it again. So what you can actually do is you can actually take an emulsion and uh, break it, add an AOH or something like that. And then what can really happen is this emulsion can actually float in the water. 
the interesting point here is there is something called uh, viscous centering. Okay, there is also something called size relaxation and shape relaxation. So there are multiple relaxation mechanisms that happens when the emulsion is breaking. So what this viscous centering means is if you pour this emulsion in a cylindrical jar and you break it, it actually becomes like a small cylinder. So see these concepts that we all have studied in school where you know it should become a sphere, minimum surface area, surface tension effect somehow seems to be not working because there are a lot more complicated interactions that are underplay at underplay in uh, such kind of uh, things. In fact, we made it. Adira did it for her MTech work. She also mapped how the pH was varying during the emulsion breaking process. Then she used a Paul Rhodes model to fit the whole thing. She has a publication related to that. Right. Now, why we really need to understand it? We need to know how the emulsion viscosity during breaking is actually happening. So what we did is, or the what you see here is a quart viscometer, what in industry is called as cup and bob. So this is the cup, this is the bomb, and this cup is stationary and this is subjected to rotation. And in fact, you can actually see the bob here, and this is the cup. And here you can see that this is going inside. Now she measured, we measured this uh, at different water content. See, because what we thought was, okay, here is an emulsion who is going to break only in terms of water content variation. So we made an emulsion 65.5, 34.5, and then we started draining out the water. We kept it at uh, over 60 degrees centigrade, and we found out 70, when it will become 70, 30, 75, 25, 80, uh, 20, and you can actually see the viscosity as a function of shear rate. This is at 45 degrees centigrade and you can actually see that this is very nicely shear thinning even at 80-20. Now this shear thinning is very important. Now why is this very important? Because this will give you enhanced workability to the material when you are doing the compaction. Okay, Because your roller is moving on top of it, it is subjected to substantially high shear rate much more than what I see here because my 100 reciprocal second is probably the limit with which I can uh, run by a rheometer because otherwise I will have turbulence and uh, all kinds of other issues, instabilities, what is really called as the coort instabilities that will uh, tailor coort vortices and all those things will come in. We won't get into those details. But in real life, the shear rates are considerably higher. So that means, contrary to what you think, when you are actually doing a cold mix with emulsion 80% wrap or 90% wrap, you have a very nice compaction window in which you can actually do it and you can actually keep doing the compaction as much as you want. I will. Uh, there are some field project related information. I may share, I may not share. I mean, anyway, there is a offline meeting in which Arpan Ghosh, who is a principal consultant of this project, is coming and giving a talk. I hope he will be able to give more details. But what happens at 60 degrees centigrade, you see that there is a reduction, but at the uh, highest level, you seem to see that there is a, uh, it behaves like a Newtonian. It is not Newtonian actually, because we were not able to go to the maximum shear rate that we want. So what you really see here is the three-stage uh, non-Newtonian response that you normally see for this material. So we are still in the first stage. So this is fascinating and we were able to repeat it for almost for four types of emulsions here. And this is the key table as far as the practitioner is concerned. So that means if you are going to use a granite uh, aggregate, what is the kind of emulsion that you are going to use, whether you are going to use cationic, anionic, or you can be more adventurous. We are trying to make a non-ionic emulsion in our laboratory for one uh, project. So you can actually see how uh, these things really vary. Now, when it comes to the next, we talk about uh, what is really called as the reclaimed asphalt binder. I will not get into the details because uh, uh, Dr. Nivita Tushara, as well as Tirmala, one of my current students, 
they are working on it and they will be making presentations nevita will make the presentation tomorrow tushara and tirumala will be doing it in the offline presentation now uh, there by this time you must have heard a lot about active binder content indication of the level of aging of the binder and all those things uh, there are claims and counter claims related to whether uh, use of wrap will give you considerable advantages related to rutting or fatigue whether one can really balance it if we know what to balance we'll be able to do the balancing okay so i will just leave this portion out for uh, dr nevita to uh, take care of it so this is about the binder part so we discussed about three types of binding agent in fact two types of binding agents so one is uh, the foam another is the emulsion and these are predominantly the cold mixes that are being used the hot mix recycling we will have a detailed session about it when we meet physically right just to give you an idea of the recipe what you are going to see for bituminous stabilized material if it is going to if you are going to use with foam you are going to you can i, I i'm just telling a typical recipe that we worked out in our laboratory that was part of a phd student work as well as for one project for which it was used so 80% wrap 19% stone dust 1% active filler and the foamed binder was made at 180 degrees centigrade with water content of 6% and the water content was 7% and there is a 75 25 so that means you add the water in two stages okay before and after so this is a recipe for foam now when you are talking about the emulsion you can now make it in different ways the first one is you could make with 100% wrap 2% of water 3% of emulsion and 0.5% cement now the cement is not actually added to this here whereas here it is added here another uh, 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 mixed design that i can give you example is 90% wrap 10% new aggregate 2.5% water 3.5% emulsion and 2% cement in fact this is the recipe that is right now uh, being executed at the gaziabad aligarh expressway lnt is the contractor the mix design was done at iit madras structural design was done by dr nivita and uh, currently the work is basically going on uh, in the ncr region okay right now uh, this is the tricky part and this tricky part is rather that i would explain uh, over when i see you uh, in in fact the main issue here is the volumetric analysis you know because you want to really get into so so we are talking in steps one after the other sequence we talked about the binder we are talking about the mix what is the first step that you would do you would want to do a really a mixed design then after mixed design you want to measure the modulus because only when you measure the modulus you can use it in your layer theory determine the thickness and do your construction right now if it is regular hot mix asphalt okay life is fairly straightforward and in fact this uh, wrap has come and made a regular hma uh, deceptively simple neither this is simple nor this is simple but at least you can say okay here is the compacted asphalt mix sample you have arrowhead you have asphalt you have aggregate and if you take the same mix just remove some of the asphalt uh, your whatever is the voids that you are going to see is what is really called as the voids in mineral aggregate so your aggregate that you are going to see is going to consist of some amount of absorbed asphalt and there is going to be effective asphalt content so whatever is the total asphalt that you are going to put in some amount is uh, going to be absorbed by the uh, aggregate and then the effective asphalt content plus our voids basically gives you the voids in mineral aggregate okay so now let us switch gear and take a look at uh, this one okay so this is about let us assume that this kind of a recipe 90% wrap 10% new aggregate 2.5% water 3.5% emulsion now this 3.5% emulsion will have water in it let us assume that it is 65 35 okay so now if you are looking at the solid portion there are going to be two types of aggregates here uh, what is called as the aria article recycled asphalt aggregate 
these are the virgin aggregate particles the surfaces can have permeable voids then there are can also be impermeable voids now there is cement that is shown as the solid then these are the aggregates now this aggregates can have virgin aggregate will be there on top of the virgin aggregate you are going to have the asphalt then your recycled aggregate is there if you look into the uh, liquid portion the emulsion basically consists of the residual bitumen and then if you are really talking about the external water that you have added there is some portion of the water that is already available in the uh, wrap or the absorbed water and there is going to be this free water so what is this free water whatever is the water that you have added here so that the emulsion can penetrate easily and the interesting part is you try to determine the YMC as if it is a granular material that's a different story and the water in the emulsion now there is a problem here because these two waters are not the same water okay so if you understand emulsion uh, chemistry the water that is available in the emulsion is not the same as the water that is available elsewhere okay so you have a counter ion that is going to diffuse into the water okay and it will take some time for these two waters to actually behave like one uh, homogeneous one so this is the liquid content that you are going to have so you are going to write separate expressions for mass separate expressions for density then now we need to determine the volumetric properties and so on and so forth I do not want to do it in an online thing because I basically would like to show, ask questions, write some numbers, get your feedback. Right. So now let us assume that we have made uh, this bitumen stabilized material either with the emulsion or with foam. And one common complaint, common, uh, com uh, I say it as a complaint because sometimes people don't really understand the distribution of air voids. So if you are a hot mix asphalt person, I am a hot mix asphalt person. Only in the last eight or nine years, I started working on this. There are few numbers that are sacred to us. 4% air voids, VMA of this percent, effective asphalt content and so on and so forth. So you construct your pavement with the seven or 8% air voids. You expect that it will get compacted and your air voids will reach to 4%. So now, when I actually use a material that has 15% air voids, I actually get uh, worried actually, what really is happening. This is the interesting point. And in fact, these pictures were taken at IIT Madras by one of our former PhD student. So you can actually see 15% air voids, 0% cement, 15% air voids, 1% cement, 10% air voids, 0% cement, 10% air voids. 1% cement. So this distribution of the air voids is the critical thing here. The air voids are so finely distributed that you can actually have 10% air void, but behave with the same uh, performance, laboratory performance or field performance that you expect from HMA. So that means the moment you realize that your concept related to air voids, you, know, you can just uh, keep it aside. And in fact, in the site when uh, these people are constructing, when we gave the mixed design to them, uh, the agencies, independent engineer or whoever it is, they have a problem in understanding that, oh, this mix has 12% air voids. Okay, but it is taking the load. Nicely, it is taking the load. Okay, there are a few issues related to that that we will talk later, right? Then we also did some uh, environmental scanning electron microscope you can actually see how the addition of cement as well as the filler and all those things completely change the structure. Now, the interesting thing here is when we did the EDEX analysis, trying to find out how much is silica, how much is calcium, there was not much difference. In fact, addition of 1% or 2% cement to such a mass of material is not really going to help you in kicking up you know, you are not going to see a trigent, you are not going to see CSH or any of those things. Hydration compounds are not going to form. Pozzolanic reactions may form, may not really happen. Okay. 
but 1% cement up to 1% cement uh, it might actually help in mopping up the moisture so that it will give you this uh, you know a spike in the stiffness that you really want but beyond that nothing is really uh, going to happen but this is the interesting part in this material so i take this uh, uh, 80 percent wrap material 19 percent stone dust one percent active filler and i add very little formed binder but what really happens is this material behaves like a viscoelastic material so that means it shows rate dependent response i would not have a courage to explain how a haver sign loading for an elastic material it shows like this and for a viscoelastic material it shows like this trust me this material behaves like an viscoelastic material or if i really want to say it in simple language you know because people want everything to be simple uh, if it is an elastic material you should not be seeing something that you see here okay that is the whole thing so let me stop it here and uh, uh, again as we go along further down the line one important point that we need to understand it though the aroids are more though the aroids are distributed uh, disparate fashion in a very nice fashion the mechanical response of the material is influenced by how exactly it gets confined because what is very important in the field is the material is confined from all direction if you try to test your material without any confinement pressure in your uh, equipment you are going to get one modulus but if you try to do the same thing with confinement you are going to get completely a different modulus so in fact you can actually see uh, different emulsion content this is the work done by one of my phd student Atanu. he is here he is also uh, coming to uh, CET to uh, make a presentation about uh, relaxation spectrum. I think that's what he is going to talk about. So when uh, you do all these things, and I am showing you a graph, if you know what is a master curve, you will understand it. If you don't know what is a master curve, don't worry about it. Basically, you can think of this as the variation of modulus as a function of reduced frequency okay so you can interpret this in terms of high temperature if you want to give it something or if you can interpret this in terms of uh, low temperature so what you can actually see here is again don't worry too much about approach one and approach two Atanu sometimes gets carried away and uh, start doing a lot of uh, fancy things but if you just focus only on this uh, filled dots filled circle as well as filled square, you will be able to see that when the material is confined, okay, you can actually see how much the modulus has increased compared to this. So if you take this in terms of uh, high temperature, you are going to see that the confinement pressure plays a critical role and it is very beneficial at very high temperature. So don't uh, uh, ignore the influence of confinement pressure and in fact you can also see how the phase angle uh, uh, varies also when you are subjecting it to the confinement pressure and some of these tricky things about modulus measurement how dynamic modulus is measured resident modulus is measured flow number is measured dry red field testing is done and how all of these things will actually be related to uh, RAP. That will be discussed by Professor Padma, Padma Rekha and Professor Neetura. Okay, so as far as, so what I showed was, uh, we talked, started talking about the mixtures. So I showed you some examples, recipe mix design about foam. Then I also showed you something about emulsion. So let us get into the hot mix recycling because those things seem to be like voodoo magic. You don't know how they will break, how they, when they will break. And then where is the chunks of foam distributed? How do they preferentially absorb the filler particle? How are they even gluing them together? Seems to be very complicated. So we are all hot mix people. So what we can do is just put 30% of wrap. If you want to add a rejuvenator, mix the whole thing. 
compact it high temperature 160 170 so who really cares about ozone layer and all those things so let's do that so comes that uh, even here you know we need to have some uh, basic understanding first and foremost thing there is a in fact uh, there is a, what you can say concern here uh, since this material is not necessarily understood how much is the wrap to be added becomes agency specific and in fact uh, when i was just going through this lecture notes from far field especially for runway payment design you realize that very recently only grudgingly only they have introduced tried to introduce wrap uh, in some runway payments they don't want to do that okay now the first thing is how much of wrap to be added the second thing, and this is where at least students here, academicians here, or people who are interested in research can actually jump in and say, why not 40%, why not 50%? Let's see what happens, okay? At least at the laboratory scale, because ultimately, if you are able to show something in a laboratory scale that is workable, and if you're able to do it in a test stretch somewhere, and if you make it also workable, you are doing a service to the nation, to the society, because you know you are able to push as much of wrap back into the road from where you took it out. Now, there are few again challenges here. What are the whether the same material characterization techniques will work here or not? We do not know. There seems to be a notion that retroresistance is better, but fatigue seems to be poor, not necessarily true. We will see it here. And uh, one interesting way of doing it will be is characterize the proportion of wrap that will give you the maximum retroresistance because it is not necessary that if you keep increasing the proportion of wrap, the rutting will keep on, retroresistance will keep on increasing, not true. So there is a bandwidth. So pick that bandwidth and try and see how the fatigue is working. And similarly, on the other hand, keep pushing as much as wrap as possible try to see how much is the fatigue, find out the bandwidth in which the fatigue it will work and now try to balance the whole thing. And uh, so let us take a look at it. And this is a point that I keep referring because we have in our laboratory few wrap binders. Navita is aware of it. Mm -hmm. These are binders that have been recycled three or four times. These structures were laid in 1992 in and that too in extreme climate in Canada, minus 30, minus 40. And they do recycling three or four times. They have done that. And to top it all, they do also use RAS shingles, okay, which is even stiffer. To just give a simple example, uh, and again, this is uh, going to be very tricky here. Uh, one a agency for which, you know, uh, we were trying to get their mixed design uh, running is 25% wrap. And now, IS-15462 is there, polymer modified bitumen is there, PMB-70 minus 10 V, V is the MSCR grade, if you don't know what is V, just don't worry about it. And they also want the expected uh, grade to be PMB-70 minus 10 V. Now there are multiple solutions to this problem. Okay, there is going to be a gradation effect that is going to come in. There is going to be the target binder grade that is going to be coming here. Okay, so we will discuss all these issues uh, in the offline meeting, uh, one of my students who is here, who will also be coming to CET, did a lot of uh, interesting work in DO using uh, design of experiment. And in fact, when you are unable to pinpoint clearly the rheological behavior at the micromechanical level, when you are not able to use a mixture theory formulation, write expressions that uh, you can use and solve and then optimize, the easiest and the simplest and the most refined approach is to do statistical analysis, design of experiment, which is what he did. So he actually made around 13 blends and he went from one extreme to the other extreme. For instance, what is the targeted softening point that you want? What is the targeted uh, viscosity at 60 degrees centigrade that you want? What is the rutting parameter that you want? G star by sine delta. What is the intermediate uh, temperature parameter that you want? Then he fitted master curve to it. And then he identified few parameters such as rheological index and all. So he went from one extreme to the other extreme. What I am showing you here is a beautiful graph. 
relaxation spectrum. So you can actually see where the wrap binder is and where many of these uh, binders are there. So there are many ways, there are many solutions that are possible for identifying how much of wrap rejuvenator should get in. And in fact, you can actually see that this is a DOE table. So there is basically no connection here. So what you do is you create this table, create solutions, construct your response surface methodologies, use this uh, setup likelihood functions, and then so on and so forth, right? Now, just to come to uh, the crux about uh, softer binder and stiffer binder, this is a data that was published in a detailed hot mix recycling report uh, for many states in US, okay? So now I want you to focus your attention in this portion. And in fact, uh, this has relevance to some of the very interesting questions that were posed before the start of this session. So you see a 0% wrap, you see 25% wrap, and these people went adventurous, went up to 55% uh, wrap here. Okay, so the binder that is used here is a softer binder, PG58 minus 28A. Uh, you can think of it in terms of if you really want to think in terms of VG, take it like VG10 or VG20. Nobody makes VG20, but just take it like that. And this, take it like PG70, somewhere between your VG30 and VG40. VG30 gives you roughly PG64, 66. Now you are going to see here something very interesting. Your 0% wrap is here, 25% wrap is somewhere here and 55% wrap is somewhere here. So it is not necessarily that if you add more wrap, you are going to get more stiffness, not true. And now let us take a look at another thing. Two, uh, you know, PG64 minus 34B, PG58 minus 34. What exactly is the influence of the binder? Uh, this modulus, in fact, you can think of this way, this virgin binder that is shown here, 64 minus 34 B, when you are actually adding 55% wrap to that material, you see how much it increase. But when you use the PG 58 minus 34 B, and you can actually see what is really happening. So increased modulus that you see here as the wrap increases is actually not really say scale scalable. And similarly, if you see here, where I have used 55% wrap, for different types of binders, okay? A and B are different sources. So two PG grades, A and B, and uh, two, uh, I mean, uh, one PG grade, two binders. Similarly, like the two PG grade, you can actually see the 55% RAM. There seems to be no uh, big connection here. So one, uh, just to conclude, uh, right now we have been working on this I mentioned to you. And the interesting part is we use the Chinese standards. JTGT5521-2019 because the uh, Caltrans or Astro specifications did not give us enough guidelines and we in fact did a lot of uh, interesting ways of uh, martial compaction. So if you are interested, uh, we can talk about it in the offline meeting. So what you can actually do is you can not worry too much about this ECRM1 and ECRM2 that is Athanos creation. So if you take a look at HMA, processing of wrap applicable CCPR, okay? And similarly, there is no, when you say there is no processing of wrap in the sense that the wrap is used as it is. The base binder is we made an emulsion with the uh, uh, 30 material. The wrap content we used is 80. In fact, on right now we are using 90 and the binder content is three and the residue content is 62 and two. There is a very interesting rat wheel testing results which I won't show it here. I will show it to you in the physical meeting if you come here. Okay, now what really are the open issues? The open issues are the following. Mixed design for BSR, emulsion, volumetric analysis, measurement of specific gravity. What is this effective specific gravity? Apparent specific gravity that we need to have a grip on. A very few people are working on it. I am familiar with the two groups, one from Europe, one from US who are working on these kind of things. Uh, in fact, one of my MTech students here, Shivashankar, he should be here. 
so he is trying to look at uh, these kind of uh, issues and then what is important here is when you have this bitumen stabilized material either with foam or with emulsion there is a, as the emulsion is breaking so it is not an instantaneous breaking it is breaking over a period of time there is a strength to gain that is happening now we need to really understand how much is the strength again because when you ultimately when you want to use them in your design calculations to estimate your layer thickness you know you are going to ask me okay so what is the modulus should i use after seven day curing 14 day curing 28 day curing you are going to ask now the construction is not going to wait for you to do it in fact in the uh, gapl project we are doing three days is the maximum time we have given so but uh, the contractor would like to do it even before that but at least in this current climate it might take up to three days for the uh, ccpr layer to gain some strength because you know it has to now take the load of the uh, hma paving layer that is coming on top of it so but since i don't have any idea about how much is the strength gain the influence of the ambient condition i'm just saying take three days time because that seems to be the practice in places where these kind of layers are so this is ad hoc but it will be interesting if you could first establish the conditions and the laboratory and then scale it up to the field and mechanical response of the bitumen stabilization material be it emulsion or foam so let us try and understand the difference between reclaiming and recycling so if it is going to be an asphalt layer it is going to be viscoelastic if you are going to use an asphalt layer in the place of a granular layer and then expect that your uh, elastic plastic kind of an analysis will work it will not really work so when we do the stress analysis we might actually get into problems the choice of the wrap binder rejuvenator it, it all depends on your taste fancy how sophisticated you want to become and all those things you could uh, be stuck with vg but i find it hard to believe it because the country whether without realizing they have as far as the modified binders are concerned they have moved into pg but without collecting the actual base data but anyway that is our style of working we jump in and then we learn and then we keep uh, changing it you could also do uh, pick MSCR and do it so as far as the mechanical response of the wrap hma is concerned as i showed you here so what should be the optimal wrap dosage okay so that typically uh, takes the cake so and in fact as i mentioned since the wrap in this country our country is young i don't really think you should be really worried about sticking it to 30 or 25 percent or something we should be at least have laboratory uh, investigations and hopefully you know if uh, uh, the kerala government comes forward have some test stretches in which we push the limits and see what really happens if it fails let it fail but at least we would have learned something and uh, something on balanced mix design so uh, what we will be covering offline will be is uh, wrap uh, mix design hot mix and cold mix emulsion so see you at uh, college of engineering true and rum and uh, my sincere thanks to aact for funding this ftp and dst and many other funding agencies that have funded iit madras payment laboratory my special thanks to Atanu, my PhD student, Thirumala, my PhD student, Abhinaya and Dr. Nivita. She did her PhD quite some time back at IIT Madras. And of course, the payment engineering and asphalt laboratory at IIT Madras. Thank you so much. It was indeed a thought-provoking session. We are really fortunate to listen to you. Thank you, sir, for giving us this opportunity and sharing your experiences and wisdom with us. We look forward to further valuable interaction in future too. Thank you, Sudhagar, sir, for joining the discussion session. Next is the discussion, discussion sessions. Participants are requested to upload your queries in the chat box, and both the experts are here to clear your queries. Participants can also raise the queries. In fact, I went ahead and answered some of the questions they asked you from you. 
thank you <laughs> i don't know whether i did a good job but i I'm think sorry. they seem to be satisfied okay good you answered all the questions there no more questions <laughs> the participants please unmute and ask questions again you are free to ask questions directly to the experts i think it's late in the night or like my undergraduate student they switch on the uh, switch off the video and go away wherever they want <laughs> hello uh, murli sir i have a small question for you this is bishwa because from lnt hi how are you i am good sir how are you yeah. yeah fine please tell me yeah yeah sir uh, we are we were also privileged to uh, do some small trials for uh, this uh, gaziabad aligarh project a few samples had uh, arrived in our small lab and we were able to get hold of this chinese specification that uh, you briefly mentioned in uh, one of your slides uh, sir i had just one query uh, this chinese specification they are harping about a process in which we have to cure the sample i am talking about mixed design you have not covered it just mm -hmm. i had a small query so I, just to understand that why they have done that uh, they are curing the sample at, at a particular temperature uh, after making uh, after giving some x amount of uh, marshall blows then after curing uh, curing of the sample in the oven they are again asking us to compact uh, to to make the sample so that i can find out the optimum emulsion content Huh. so uh, so i was not able to relate this exercise to the site that how how this is relevant <clears throat> to site and but but we found that uh, the the indirect tensile strength that uh, reddy sir was also uh, pointing out at 15 degrees there was there was there was a lot of improvement so yeah. how that compaction takes place and how relevant it is to site yeah a good point actually in fact this is a very interesting specification and in fact in the uh we had a detailed discussion with your site team also related to this see the idea is if you actually go to the site and see where the currently the construction work is going on uh you lay this as ccpr layer 25 cm and you allow two days or three days for the strength gain to happen and then after the strength gain happens you have the hot mix asphalt train coming on top of it so what we do is we make a emulsion uh, uh, the ccpr sample we give 75 blows and this 70 uh, 50 blows and this 50 blows is supposed to simulate the compaction that is given by the during the roller passes then the remaining 25 blows in essence gives you that enhanced strength that you are going to get during the curing process now we need to think in a slightly different way normally when we talk about 75 blows or 125 gyrations you have a laboratory and a field compaction associated with that here they do not really consider those kind of things so they split this compaction into two portion so the second portion is related to the increase in the strength that happens so that is why what we do is we make the we don't demold it we keep it in the oven take it out and then apply 25 blows and uh, right now when you go i mean they have collected lot of data from the field you take a core and you measure the its value you get within the error bounds permissible you get more or less what is expected let's say we were getting around 500 kilo pascal and uh, so we were able to get around 450 to 550 in that range so in a sense it is simulating the uh, uh, roller compaction plus the densification and strength gain that you see in the field that's the only idea so i have a question from uh, kiran thank you in, sir yeah. yeah in cold mix design using emulsion specification is given as 3.5 where residue bit bitumen get charged when emulsion is changed instead of specifying uh no i would not do that actually see because if you ask any emulsion manufacturer they can make you an in fact when a spec is written for emulsion they don't really specify they only specify a range of the residue 62 minimum or 63 minimum so you always want to say it in terms of the emulsion and not in terms of the residue 
and the residue you get it after some point of time okay you don't see this uh, water going away mysteriously in one day or something okay yeah maybe professor sudhakar reddy can add something to it No more questions? I think that could be for me. Yes, sir. So there, there is no specification for the minimum amount of blending that is required because first and foremost, uh, it is very difficult to estimate how much it is happening. So it has to be in terms of uh, the properties of the vitamin that you get or in terms of the mix that uh, properties of the mix that you get. There is no specification for the degree of blending that you need to achieve. Professor you want to add anything? Yes, sir. I think it is fine. Okay. Is the message box allowing one at a time or what? <laughs> I'm not sure. <laughs> uh, sir, uh, this is Shalini. Shalini, how are mm -hmm. you? Uh, sir, I'm fine. Is this for Professor Reddy or for me? You have to state that first. Uh, sir, this is regarding centrifuge extraction. Okay, that's for Professor Reddy. Oh, extraction, okay. Uh, sir, uh, we are we have been extracting some core samples. So what we face mostly is after centrifuge extraction, when we collect the uh, bitumen mix solvent, we still find fines, even after wet sealing and even after keeping many filter paper, some amount of fines come into the bitumen extracted. You'll get that, yeah. So I think you, you, you have to get it through the recovery process. Uh, how, when how, we, are you, how are you recovering bitumen from the solvent? Uh, we recover by uh, distillation. We don't have absent method. Okay. We have the basic distillation. Okay. So the double barrel. Right. So, but when we recover um, the salt, uh, we collect the solvent, but the binder which we get becomes very stiff. So from that, in that residue, we are unable to find the amount of fines. Not able to find the fines from the, uh, you are losing some filler, isn't it? Yes, sir. Yeah, I think uh, it, it always happens. I think, uh, but uh, you, I think your re recovery process, you should be able to find what is the remaining filler that went with uh, your solvent. Uh, if you do uh, the recovery process, distillation, also you should be able to get it. Did you calculate with a known uh, gradation mix? Uh, yeah, actually, when we uh, calculate, we are uh, instead of getting some five point, uh, getting it less, like five point uh, three, if they have used field, we are okay. getting five point six or something. No, yes. field, field uh, you don't assume what they suggest is correct. Uh, your laboratory prepared specimen. Oh, laboratory prepared specimens. Yeah, yeah, with known gradation, known binder content, you I think you verify your process. Okay. Uh, you could find where it is going. Uh, field do not know what is there. Okay, sir. And field core, uh, you don't assume that uh, field uh, design binder content is 5.3, you're not getting that. Don't worry about that. You calibrate your process with known uh, gradation, known binder content. Uh, we did that in the lab. There also we are getting the problems. So there is some problem with the uh, method we are following. Yeah, you are, uh, I think, losing filler there. Uh, it is going with your uh, solvent. Yes. I think your recovery process, you should be able to identify how much uh, filler is there. Professor Murli, you want to add? Yeah. Uh, Salini, this is fairly straightforward, actually. Okay. See, I just want to highlight on what Professor Reddy said. 
do not try to calibrate anything based on any field code. Okay, so you set up a laboratory procedure and just to add that if you have come to our lab, you know, you, you spent a lot of time at IIT Madras, we use a small vacuum pump actually. So that, you know, and then put that Wattman filter paper number 10 or something and use a small vacuum pump. Most of your, almost all of your filler will get, uh, uh, you know, you can, uh, it's just a matter of fine tuning your process. There is no big uh, uh, rocket mechanics here. So, I mean, uh, if I have time, I can come and look into it. We have vacuum pump. Then you should use your vacuum pump. So, organization should ask one or two questions. Okay, there is a question. What is the quality check done on wrap aggregates? You mean the extracted aggregates, I believe? The extracted aggregates, they are subject to the same uh, uh, properties as that of regular aggregates. All the aggregate impact and all those things will have to be satisfied. Because they are going to be part of that. that. Yeah. Apart from the regular uh, uh, like routine uh, tests that are done as part of physical properties checking, any specific, uh, any additional uh, test that is needed need to be done? On, not, for, uh, not from, not to my knowledge, uh, from performance consideration. Uh, can I ask uh, why you are asking this? You have something in mind? Uh, no, sir. Just, uh, okay. just to no, know. I think, uh, yeah, no specific test, no additional test. Uh, okay, sir. Thank you. Any more questions? Uh, hello. I yes, think yes. Sir, the, uh, all the participants are fully satisfied and all the queries of them were answered by the experts. <laughs> so that's the conclusion we have to draw. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Asha, there is so much of information that was given by Professor Sudhakar Reddy. It will take a lot of time for these people to even digest this. Digest. Uh -huh. <laughs> if this is even for practitioners who are working in this field, if there are participants who are not working in this field, it will just go. There is so much. I mean, I hope they will be able to watch the recording again. Slowly, slowly do it. Go slide by slide. Yes. Tushara, do you have any question? Uh, no, sir. I too agree with uh, what you said. Like uh, whoever is working in that might completely get, but for others, they will get take some more time to understand it clearly and pose the questions. So I think uh, we, by uh, so uh, we will keep on collecting the queries uh, related to this and keep you posted uh, to okay. the uh, specific to the session. Sure. So, so by further further uh, sessions, they will be able to ask more queries related to uh, this. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. Okay. 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 One more okay. question. Bye. Good night. One, one question. Yes. Yeah, Murli sir, what are the ways to improve the ITS values of BSM material? We observe that increase in cement or addition of virgin aggregate. Okay. Uh, so this is a long discussion. You know, uh, we can <laughs> have it. See, because these are all, see, you need to understand these are minimum values. Sometimes 300 kilopascal, 400 kilopascal and all those things. So it is, see, this ITS test is a, you need to do it very, very carefully. It is not a, don't think that it is a simple straightforward test. And that too for our material, which will show loading rate sensitivity. Many times I have seen people having calibrated their loading jig correctly. 
if the loading rate is different your its values are going to be different number 1 number 2 if you think that adding the cement will keep on giving your uh, increased uh, its value it's not going to happen okay so you are basically going to get these kind of curves always it goes for the percentage of wrap also so one needs to do uh, a lot of test and we need to understand that the its value helps you to identify your binder content you know to verify some portion of your mixed design aspect ideally if you would really like uh, to use to find out the modulus values or laboratory based performance you need to take it to a different level sir you want to add something do you want to add something i think you are muted sir Yeah, he is asking, I think, how to improve the uh, yeah. ITS value. Yeah. Uh, I think uh, uh, we, we are discussing, I think, uh, between two different materials, modified and then stabilized materials. Uh, I think our uh, specifications are more aligned towards uh, uh, modified materials, not stabilized material, simply because we don't want to uh, add cracking to that. So we are more on the modified side, hence we don't actually try to increase the stiffness of the material to such an extent. Okay. Uh, I, I didn't understand why increase in cement uh, did not increase the, uh, he is only referring to ITS, so maybe other parameters would have increased. Yeah, so in fact, that's what I was trying to tell him that if the test has to be conducted first carefully, it's a very sensitive test. Okay then. Yeah, I think, uh, uh, I think Notice. nothing, sir. Ah, thank you. Sir, one more doubt, Kavita. Hmm, Kavita, this is for Professor Reddy, right? <laughs> Both of you. Yeah, fine, sir. whatever. <laughs> yeah, so I would like to know more about the polymer modified between emissions. How does uh, uh, um, that is influencing CA, EM at high RAP and influences mechanical and uh, performance properties? Polymer modified. I think polymer modified it is yours. Wrap is mine. Yes. <laughs> Both uh, are what yours, sir. <laughs> what, what is the question? She wanted to know whether Kavita is this correct? You wanted to know whether the addition of polymer modified binder will improve the what is it? Yeah, mechanical and performance of um, properties of wrap. Wrap. Yeah, if you replace a, virgin, a, a conventional virgin binder with a binder which has got typically better performing characteristics, either in terms of velocity, recovery, whatever it is, it is going to add that to wrap mix as well to some degree, definitely. Is that clear? Yes. Yeah. Sir, to add on to that, can I ask one though? Yeah. Please. Uh, Charlie, sir, uh, when we collect the wrap from the site, uh, we don't know what kind of binder it is. So if there is a polymer modified binder, there, how do we differentiate it? With, uh, no, from the look, yeah, from the look of it, and then most most uh, physical tests you won't be able to do unless you do some possibly chemical analysis. Uh, those tests only. Are, is it possible to find it from here, sir? Uh, find find. So from the property, rheological properties, is it possible? No, I don't think the rheological properties of the extracted binder you'll be able to make out. Okay. Unless it has got significant recovery, if it's a fresh vitamin, fresh mix, for some reason it failed, you extracted that. Uh, it would, unless you're, let's say, you still get your elastic recovery 70, 80 percent, that kind of a thing. New mix uh, which has failed, you remove that. Uh, unless you get such indications, very difficult to identify that from physical testing. And even if you do that, you won't know what kind of polymer was used, what was the dosage that was used. So you just, you are better off not probing in that direction because you will never get a correct answer. Yes, sir, because here in some stretches, they have used NRMBs. So in some places we can't identify. They also don't know because when the engineer changed, they don't know. It is better you don't know that because NRMB is a menace. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, and Kerala keeps on insisting to use NRMB because you have rubber plantations. 
okay you are better off not getting into that thing you can assume it to be a wrap binder black and keep going for okay sir so oh, I, i think uh, the uh, will uh, the queries uh, there are no, no more further queries uh, right now so uh, we we were fortunate to have such uh, a uh, intense session on uh, the recycled asphalt pavement today afternoon uh, both the experts are specifically working in that area and that gave the the lectures a flavor of uh, Uh, the uh, the very in, uh, very uh, sp specific uh, intense details related to the uh, projects so uh, the uh, people the uh, the uh, academicians will be able to uh, take up further uh, projects related to uh, rap uh, based on the presentations and they can uh, carry forward further research and whoever has mo is motivated to carry out further research and that can uh, come forward uh even though they have not registered now uh, they can uh, uh for the offline session and if still they wanted to attend the offline session uh, we are welcome just uh, inform us uh, so uh, with that i think we can wind up today's session we'll keep collecting the queries related to uh, this particular session and keep uh, the experts posted on that thank you Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Good night. Can I add something? No, no, it's okay. You are, you are well <laughs> spoken. It well. Okay. Okay then. We'll wind up today's sessions and we'll meet tomorrow. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Murli sir and Rajesh sir. Thank you so much for sparing your valuable time. Yeah. Pressure. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Bye. Bye.